Okay, let us, we're going to start today and let us open our Bibles together to Peter's first epistle, to 1 Peter chapter 4, go to 1 Peter chapter 4, we are we're going through this letter in a in a uh, in a expository fashion, and if you remember that in verse seven, Peter reminds the church that the end of all things is coming, and uh, that the end of all things is coming, and, and referring to the consummation of history when Christ returns to the earth and reigns for, um, reigns for a thousand years with his people and then recreates the universe in a perfect state without disease, without sin, without death and without a devil. And he writes about it because in the midst of persecution Peter's church can take the rise of their momentary trials and be encouraged with the permanent eternal glory to come and uh, yeah, encouraged by looking at the future meaning eschatology the study of the last days Peter is giving us a, uh, a like, overview of eschatology which is much more um, it's a much deeper uh, it's much deeper than discerning current events it's much bigger than best-selling book series it's much more fascinating than Hollywood movies and it is much more powerful than empty traditions Eschatology has, uh, make, has, a, has a purpose in our daily life as Christians. For example, for Paul, eschatology brought comfort and encouragement. And, yeah, it was a source of comfort and encouragement. And when he wrote the letter to the Thessalonians, he talks about. Um, he talks about. He says at the end, therefore comfort one another with these words. Uh, yeah, in First Thessalonians 4.18, meaning that eschatology for him was comforting. He wrote to the Thessalonian church so that they would encourage each other with these words. And after that, he talks about judgment in the end times and ends with, therefore, comfort one another and build up one another. So, uh, um, so uh, yeah, in the end, knowing that, yeah, eschatology is to uh, encourage each other and each other and build one another up. Like, like to the Corinthians, he writes about the rapture and ends with, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable always ab abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So you see how eschatology has um, practical um, consequences. To the Apostle John, eschatology meant sanctification. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been manifested as yet what we will be, but we know that when He is manifested, we will be like Him, because He will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. So for John, eschatology at uh, the end times was an encouragement and a source for uh, sanctification. And for Peter, um, for, uh, for Peter, eschatology fuels godly living, beginning from the house of God and overflowing to the world, opening doors for the reception of the gospel. So people you know, can see our lives and that, op and that yeah, opens the doors to the gospel. So, eschatology isn't only like in the study of the last days, but it translates itself into like practical actions in uh, the daily life of the Christian. So, uh, Peter says that 
uh, yeah, yeah, Peter tells us that because of eschatology, uh, because we should be, uh, uh, be pursued. Uh, yeah, because of eschatology, we must uh, pursue holiness. Not it makes us pursue holiness. It translates into pursuit of holiness and a pursuit of love. Pursuit of holiness as you commun commune with God through prayer, having your thoughts under control, being alert, staying awake, because the Master is coming back. So pursue of love, fervent agape love for the brothers that takes your love capacity to its max and covers the multitude, a plethora of sins, bringing unity within the body of Christ. That's what we already saw but today. We'll look at the last three verses in this short section where Peter continues to admonish the church to an excellent conduct at all times and in all circumstances, especially when we're passing through hard times. And the second coming of Christ is a powerful motivation for it and for the purpose of God's glory. That's what we will see today, but before we start, let's pray. Dear Father, not, uh, yeah, dear Lord, we are waiting for your return. We know it's imminent, and that is why we want to learn and apply all these uh, truths that, and knowledge of the advance that you command us in your word, so that we may have uh, love in, a, in the church, but that it would overflow and be visible to the outside world. And that by saying that, they be uh, attracted to the gospel. Please bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. And today's message is called Love in Action. Let us read uh, verses 7 through 11, and our focus will be uh, verses 9 and, uh, through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is one speaking the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Verses, uh, verses 9 through 11 have one imperative, an explanation for this imperative and a purpose for it, and that's how we'll divide our study. We'll see, look at love in action, we'll look at love in service, and we'll look at love in doxology. Number one, love in action. Look at verse 9. Peter writes, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. The, the divine commandments for the church, uh, the prescription of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit to Peter for the church here is to be hospitable. Um, yeah, hospitable. We have to be uh, hospitable, and the word and the word in Greek is philoxenos, which means philos to be kind, to love as a friend, plus the second word, which is xenos, which means strangers. So Peter is literally telling us that we must be kind to strangers, we must love strangers as friends. 
It is to have an affectionate concern for strangers that expresses itself in helping them. For example, offering them food and shelter. Or, uh, yeah. Careful. Strangers here does not refer to, to anyone in the world, to all the strangers in the world that we see around us. No, but to the brothers and sisters whom you do not know. A brother or sister who doesn't, isn't part of your like, assembly or circle, but nonetheless is a brother or sister. They are Christians, but they are strangers because they are not like you direct friends. In other words, hospitality uh, that Peter prescribes here is love in action. Hospitality what, what not, not something new that Peter uh, wrote about, but it was commanded in the Old Testament, in Exodus 22 or Deuteronomy 14. But the book of Hebrews contains an astonishing admonition. Turn to Hebrews 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. The commandment still stands. The author of the Epistle to the Hebrews refers to all that has come before him, and the commandment still stands. That is why the verse begins with, do not neglect. It is something that they knew, that we all know is right, and that we know that it is good to yeah, to welcome others, but we tend to forget to do so, or simply we don't want our little bubble to be bothered, and so we forget. But we must show hospitality even to strangers, and the writer sends the reader back to those that were hospitable, and those strangers were in fact angels. For example, look at Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18. The same happened with Lot in Genesis 19. And the same happened with Gideon in Judges 6. And with Manoah, Samson's father, in Judges 13, etc. We we want uh, to be hospitable. They were all hospitable. They showed kindness to strangers, not knowing that those strangers were angelic beings. They were divine messengers that lived in the presence of God. And in Abraham's case, one of them was the Lord himself. Abraham didn't wait for the three men to ask for help. He proactively saw a need but, uh, and caused everything in his life to bring comfort and support and provide for them. He saw it as an opportunity, not as a duty. It was a privilege, not an obligation. In fact, not knowing two of them were angels, and the third was God Almighty in the person of Jesus, Abraham saw his hospitality to them as a blessing for himself. It was something that he wanted, it was something that he was seeking. In Genesis 18.3, Abraham said, and my Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. He wanted to serve them. Be, uh, be careful. This does not say that you should welcome strangers into your home because they can be angels. But not, not at all. We apply it 
in recognizing that our acts of kindness, our hospitality to strangers, our willingness to help to others, um, goes, uh, goes much farther than the act itself. Yeah. Our sacrifice to fulfill a need in others go way further than the act in itself. They reach far and wide, and as we bless them, in doing so, we are blessed too. We are hospitable with that love to action. In the degree we can, with discernment and wisdom, and out of love. But we are hospitable. And we want to want to welcome and serve. Go back to First Peter. Or nine, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Notice that Peter adds to one another, clearly referring to the recipients of the letter, signifying, uh, signifying the church. Uh, it's the persecuted church, which is in to, uh, modern Turkey, came to refuge themselves and others that will come there, and all those people are strangers. None of them know each other, but they are brothers. Meaning, those brothers and sisters that you don't know well, that are strangers in a sense, but since they are Christians, we must be hospitable, we must be kind to them and love them as friends. You see, we need to supply it without waiting to be asked. You, you open your home to them, you give, your, you give them your time, you let them disturb your daily routine and comfort, you show a kindness and love to them. Because that is hospitality. It's not being centered on oneself. And you know what? Peter says to do it without grumbling at the end of verse 9. And by writing this, Peter recognizes that hospitality can be burdensome, that it has a cost. And it can be not easy at times. Maybe we're tired, maybe we already spent a lot. It's not easy sometimes. But what matters is not only the act, but the attitude, the heart, the selflessness, the willingness to serve others in spite of yourself. We must really want to serve others despite of yourself. Listen, we were instructed to love fervently the brothers, to let our love cover a multitude of sins, but that is that is not limited to Christians, you know, and to life and our friends with no. Such love is extended beyond your struggle. Such love is manifested in actions and is ready to show that kindness and to serve and even forgive other brothers and sisters that are close to you. Think about it. Peter is asking the church in modern day Turkey, those that are themselves exiles, to love other brothers and sisters that perhaps will seek to find the refuge in their cities. They are strangers. Nevertheless, they are brothers. And the church is commanded to show them love and to open their homes to them and to be kind, as if they were friends for a long time. That's the way the gospel was spread in the first century. Traveling ministers like Paul and those after him 
did not stay in the inns of those days because they were houses of sin and bad reputation. The early church survived thanks to the hospitality given to traveling brothers and sisters that were welcomed in, attended, helped, treated as close friends. That's hospitality, that is fervent love in action, but in action. We're supposed to have that love for one another, but in action. And by the way, hospitality is a deal breaker, a qualifier for an elder in the church in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and a characteristic of a godly woman in 1 Timothy 5 and Proverbs 31. Hospitality is a Christian mark. Friends, if we are commanded to be hospitable to the complete uh, uh, strangers, how much more should we be hospitable with one another? Ask yourself, you have to ask yourself, how many times have you gone out of your way, walked that extra mile, forgot about yourself, in order to comfort and supply and help and love that brother that has a need, even if you don't know him well. Yeah, uh, give a service to a brother that you don't know very well. That is what we must do, Peter says. We must uh, need a brother, a sister, and we must act upon it. The Lord Jesus com com commends such hospitality, particularly during persecution. In Matthew 25, if you want to turn with me to Matthew 25, Matthew 25, just for the context, Matthew 24, Jesus has been talking about the end times from chapter 24. At the end of chapter 25, he speaks about final judgment, and how true Christians manifested their love in action to persecute the church in the time of the tribulation, and how those that were not born again close their hearts before them. Look at Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right, and the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed to, uh, of My Father, inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. 
for I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they themselves also will answer, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Friends, how can we not be hospitable and serve our brothers and sisters? How can we not show kindness even to strangers? If we are recipients of the greatest kindness of all, eternal life and the salvation of our souls. And Peter, knowing that the time is short, says, Love each other fervently and from the heart, because you are able, through your new birth, and, uh, and show that uh, love through the uh, uh, through hospitality, because the Holy and the Holy Spirit, because because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. John MacArthur said, salvation is not just atonement, salvation is not just forgiveness, salvation is regeneration, it is transformation, it is the imparting of a new kind of life, the life of God in the soul of man. That is love in action. Number two, love in service. Let me go back to our text, First Peter chapter 4. Look at First Peter chapter 4 and, and look at verse 10. It writes, As each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter affirms that each one of the brothers, each one of you and me, has received a gift. Each one of us has received a gift, a Holy Spirit given gift, a gift granted to each believer for the purpose of serving each other. It is a supernaturally given capacity to minister other members in the church. So what are those gifts? What are those gifts? There are two lists written by Paul. First, let's go together to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look, starting from verse 4 until verse 11. Paul writes, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of workings, but the same God who works everything in everyone. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is profitable. For to one who is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To someone else, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the workings of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To someone else, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the translation of tongues. But to one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. So we see from this text that there is a variety of gifts in verse 4. That the Spirit gives whatever is profitable to each one in verse 7. 
After that, verse 8 through uh, 8, 9, and 10, Paul gives us a list with gifts that were active during the apostolic age, such as working miracles and healing and speaking in tongues and others that are still active today, like wisdom and faith. By the way, we studied a six-part series on the spiritual gifts, or les dons spirituels, which you can find on our website in French and Russian to go deeper into this subject. Notice how verse 11 points to the sovereign will of the Holy Spirit that chooses what to give to each individual individual notice how he yeah he points out and yeah how he gives a gift that makes everyone unique and all and it's interesting that the word for individually in verse 11 is uh, comes from the word idiot idios from where we get idiot that that in reality had no, had no negative meaning, but means simply someone that is unique, particular, or unequal, that there is nobody like him. That, is, that, was the, that was the meaning of idios, and after that, that, that um, after, that was used for uh, people who suffered from a mental handicap. And so when Paul writes, uh, what Paul writes is that the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts individually from idios, meaning that there is nobody else like you. Whatever measure, whatever combination of gift the Holy Spirit has bestowed on you, makes you unique and precious and necessary. Yeah, it makes you unique and precious and necessary to minister to other believers around you. Think of it as a fingerprint or as uh, snowflakes or rainbows. They all appear to be the same and yet they abs are absolutely different from each other. The Holy Spirit has given you a gift, and that gift makes you unique and necessary to serve the body of Christ. The second list is in Romans 12. Let's go there. Let's look at Romans 12. Romans 12, and look at verse 4 until verse 8. Paul writes, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of another, but having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, <coughs> whether prophecy in agreement with the faith or service in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching or he who exhorts in his exhortation he who gives with generosity he who leads with diligence he who shows mercy with cheerfulness and again, Paul explains that we all have different gifts, different functions. All those gifts are different, and he makes a parallel with the human body. There are different parts. Uh, there are other parts. The human body has different parts with different functions working together for a purpose. And by the way, in the first Corinthians 12 passage that we just read, the argument continues also by comparing us with a human body. And, that, and he makes the argument that we must work together as the body. And here, 
here in Romans, Paul gives us a list as well and says simply, whatever gift you have, use it. Teach, exhort, serve, give generously, etc. These gifts are not the same for everybody, but each one of you is unique because the Holy Spirit saw fit to grant someone one gift and to another another gift, to another one uh, a combination and to another one a different one. God knew what he was doing when he gifted you and if you do not put that gift into practice if you are effectively a visitor to the church on Sundays and if you don't seek to serve your brothers and sisters you are being a detriment to the body of Christ. You are holding back the blessing you are meant to be for others. The question is, what is your gift? And to answer, there's a simple answer. Your gift is what you can do to serve Christ. Whatever you know you can do to be a blessing to others, you know those strengths and people see them in you. That is your gift. Your gift is a graciously and free given mode of ministry, a supernatural capacity to minister the church, and it is given and energized by the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about human talents, but that divine enablement so you can serve your brothers and sisters, not for your pleasure, not so that others come and uh, congratulate you, but to serve the body of Christ, and that is what Peter instructs us to do. To serve. If you don't know or are not sure what your spiritual gift is, just know that you already have it. If you're a Christian, you have, you have been sovereignly has been sovereignly bestowed upon you as part of your regeneration. So, make yourself available to serve, and you will see the direction and motivation for the, that the Holy Spirit has for you. When you do that, when you help others, the Holy Spirit uh, will give you direction and motivation. So make yourself self available. Make sure your life is being shared with brothers and sisters. Be attentive and serve when you see a need. And even if you don't see it, serve and you will soon find out. You will find out what is the Holy Spirit's gift for your life. Make yourself available, open your eyes and serve. We are not many in this room, I tell you, there are many needs. You want to see something change in this assembly? Do it. You see that the chair was um, dirty, clean it, etc. So we go back to First Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 10. As each one has received the gift, employed in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Again, Peter is telling us put it into service, employ it, use it. We have an obligation to serve one another. And even if you think that your gift won't benefit others, or that is not as important or visible as someone else's, the instruction here is clear. Use it. 
In the passage in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says that just as a human body cannot function properly without one of its members, so it is with the church. We need each other to function properly and as the Lord intended. We must work together. We have an obligation before God, whether we like it or not. If we are, whether we are outgoing or timid, if we are new or old in the faith, if we are young or old, listen, if you are a Christian, you must serve others. You were saved to serve, to serve with the brothers and sisters. Charles Spurgeon said, There is no, no Christian who does not seek to serve his God. The very motto of the Christian should be, I serve. You must use your gift. You must put our gift into use to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters and to the church. And Peter writes that we are to do it as good stewards. Yes, good stewards. And the word that he uses here refers to a house manager. A house manager, meaning someone that is made responsible to manage the property that has been entrusted to him. And in the same way, you are not you are not the you are not the owner of your gifts. God entrusted it to you so that you put it into practice, that you use it to be a blessing to the church and to let your love be seen in service. He writes in, in the end of verse 10, he writes the mindful grace of God, which literally means the varied colors, which reminds us what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, that the diversity, the color palette, the unique combination of the gifts that God can give you, Making, making you unique and necessary in the life of the church. So you are crucial, nobody can take your place in the church. If you are not among your brothers, the church suffers. You are crucial, you are, you are essential. Peter condenses the infinite possibilities of spiritual gifts into two main categories. Look at verse 11a. Whoever speaks as one speaking the oracles of God, as one speaking the, as one speaking the oracles of God, whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies. Here are the two categories. First category, speaking. That is preaching, teaching, giving words of wisdom, sharing of knowledge, discernment, leadership. And secondly, is serving, service, administration, management, in the gift of prayer, fervently, uh, the gift of prayer fervently, showing mercy, general help, generosity, meet, meeting the needs of others, etc. Morality when giving and meeting needs. So if your gift is in the category of speaking, verse 11 says that you ought to speak the oracles of God, meaning God's truth, God's word as opposed as your opinion or ideas. Whatever you say, you must find its source in the word of God. Whatever you say, you must find its source in the word of God. And secondly, if your gift is in the category of service, verse 11 says that you must serve 
serving God's strength, not in yours. We must be walking in the spirits, selflessly giving up, be humble and dependent, and God will work through you with your imperfections and tiredness and personality. You will be a blessing to others with, with your um, yeah, you can with, with your perfections and tiredness and personality you can be a blessing to others. Charles Spurgeon said, yes, I agree with Spurgeon, who was frank and direct when he said, when he said that um, something, that if you don't serve brothers and sisters, it's because you don't have love in you. And if you don't have love in you, if you don't have love to serve, which means, that means you don't, are not regenerated, you are not a Christian. He said, I want every member of this church to be a worker. We do not want any idlers. If there are any of you who want to eat and drink and do nothing, there are plenty of places elsewhere where you can do it. There are uh, empty seats elsewhere in abundance. Go and fill them, for we do not want you. To finish, number three, love in doxology. So what is the ultimate purpose of all this? From verse 7, knowing that Jesus is coming back soon, being of sound thinking and alert for prayer and the pursuit of holiness, loving the brothers fervently and covering their sins with it, being hospitable towards strangers, but particularly to the brothers, for putting in practice our spiritual gifts, of speaking and serving. What is the ultimate purpose? Look at verse 11b, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Friends, our purpose is that God will be glorified through Jesus Christ, the one that lived the perfect life and gives it to us so it is counted as ours, that God will look at us clothed in Jesus' righteousness and perfection, having poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross for the law that we broke. He, he suffered on the cross for the law that we broke. Jesus pays our fine before the judge of the universe so we can be set free because, of it, because his perfect life is credited to us and our sinful life is credited to him. The eternal punishment that God served, reserved for sinners was exhausted by Jesus on that cross. And Jesus died and he was buried but three days later he came back to life because his mission as a savior had been successful in response we repent and we place our trust in Jesus and God grants us forgiveness in eternal life he forgives us not because we deserve it but because Jesus earned it for us Therefore, in consequence, God receives all the glory and all of our praise through Jesus. He receives the praise, the honor, the glory from us, sinners saved by His grace, and our lives are lived in such a way that whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, as Paul writes, will be to the glory of God. That are looking, that are looking forward to Christ's return, our love to the brothers, our constant forgiveness, our hospitality, all of that, even if it is heavy for us at times, will be done knowing that God is being glorified.
Peter's heart has been considering eschatology since verse 7. Uh, the glorious future and consummation of all things. So that he cannot but stop himself in the middle of his letter and utter praises to God. Peter's heart is fixed now in the glory that is due to God. His heart explodes in doxology and praises, and he writes, To whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Amen, he says. Yes, let it be. That my life that my life may bring glory to God. Whether it take whatever it takes through peace and persecution, that everything I say, I think, I do, I plan, I reject and pursue through tiredness, self sacrifice and life endless trials that in all things God be glorified, because to Him belongs all the glory from eternity past, through the present, and for the rest of eternity in the future. And he says, Amen. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, all the glory belongs to you, the eternal glory of the past, present, and future that you saved us. Thank you. Thank you that you gave us your spirit and gifts that we may use them, and, and we love each other in, in, in practice. Thank you that you give us a family, the church, so that we may serve each other and forgive each other and uh, grow in sanctification together that you give us your word also may you all glory be to you for having saved us sinners for having saved criminals who were supposed to suffer your wrath but that Jesus saved us paid. thank you uh, yes thank you may these instructions that we receive today change our hearts that we may manage to be hospitable to love each other that now that we are in peace, we may, while we are in, in peace, we may be able to do it. In Jesus' name, Amen.